Unit 1, Module 4. Welcome to Module 4. In this module, we'll dig deeply into the third eye of the foundational principles of my design philosophy, the concept of iteration. We'll discuss how iteration applies to the level design process and go over some best practices for an iterative approach to design. In the last module, we discussed invention and its importance in the level design process. Remember that the key to invention is a willingness to challenge preconceived notions and play with interesting solutions to design challenges. Our quote this time comes from the international award-winning industrial designer Mustak Kobanli. Kobanli says, Great design is the iteration of good design. As we discussed in previous modules, good design starts with clear intention and contains elements of invention. But quality in the final product comes from iteration. Our definition of iteration differs a little bit from the one found in the dictionary. We will define iteration as the process of doing something again and again to improve the final result or product. In terms of level design, iteration means reworking or refining your product, in this case your level, repeatedly to better realize your intentions or to add new invention to the product. But what does that mean exactly? It means that nobody ever gets creative work right the first time they try. That's why we approach everything with the idea of iterative passes. Build, refine, repeat. And there's a list of steps here, but let's look at them as a flowchart. As we've already learned, in step one, we start by solidifying the vision of what we're trying to accomplish. In step two, we record it in any way that feels natural. Step three, then, is to make a plan to express those intentions, being thoughtful and deliberate. Step four, build against the plan. And once you reach a point at which you feel you can make a valid assessment against your intentions, we move on to step five and examine the execution on the design. We test it to see what's working and what's not. And often this means getting feedback from external sources. Once we've assessed our progress, then we move on to step six and make a new plan on how to continue refining the work. At this point, when you're making your refined plan, it's often critical to think about subtraction. Subtraction is cutting elements from the plan or from the design so that the core of the experience is better expressed or that you're using your limited resources in as efficient a way as possible. We repeat the steps of the iterative process until the project is complete. Oh, there, okay, that sounds pretty easy, doesn't it? Of course, putting this flowchart into practice is the real trick. There are a number of very important things to remember about an iterative approach. Let's talk about step five, the point in our iterative process where we review our work. As you're reviewing, don't get caught up in chasing meaningless buzzwords like fun or immersion. Subjective qualities like those, or really any subjective qualities, can be very hard to measure and vary greatly from person to person. As you're reviewing your work, it's imperative that you have a clear understanding of the metrics that you're measuring against. So try to break your intentions down into measurable elements. Things like how long does it take players to finish the level or how many times do they fail and specifically where do they fail. Another useful measurement is perhaps how frustrated they feel as they're playing through the content. 
modern development teams have access to very sophisticated methods of collecting and mining data about the player experience. If you're lucky enough to be working in an environment where you have those resources, set yourself up to take advantage of those tools. But, and that's a big but, One common problem is that games can start data-based testing too soon. Premature data-based feedback is at best unhelpful, but at its worst, it can be distractive or even destructive to the progress of a project. Game gets pushed into the playtest lab, all this playtest data starts getting spat out, and senior executives start looking at it and making choices saying, well, it doesn't seem like it's fun, blah, blah, blah. And if you haven't actually expressed those core intentions, you find yourself fighting for your life or the life of your project uh, prematurely. The key lies in the clarity of your intentions. If you're crystal clear about what you're trying to achieve, then you can better judge how close you are to achieving your goals and also whether or not you're ready to start database testing. When you're evaluating how your project is coming together, you have to be very careful about how you manage feedback. Feedback can be incredibly valuable, but it can also have a devastating effect if it's coming from the wrong source or if it's pushing you to make unproductive changes. As an example, let me offer a painful anecdote from my own career. I was the multiplayer lead designer for the first Halo game. We were an incredibly small team, and so I was also the lead level designer, the audio designer, and the team intern as well. <laughs> Deep in the life of the project, everyone was intently focused on shipping Halo in time for the launch of the original Xbox platform. And I was overseeing playtests of all the multiplayer levels, and of course, making changes to help balance them. One day, my lead tester, who's named Ryan, showed up at my desk, and he was quite perturbed. The test team had just finished a playtest of one of the maps called Sidewinder. If you've already played Sidewinder, then I apologize. But I need to explain a little bit to help make this story make some sense. The intention for Sidewinder was to create a horseshoe-shaped map with three paths between the two enemy bases. The timing for each path was meant to be roughly the same, the intention being that players on each team could choose the path that they wanted to use to attack the enemy and move out at the start of the match. Then battles would play out depending on which path the other team had chosen. The three paths were... one path high on the cliffs using a series of caves that were linked by teleporters. Teleporters are indicated on this flow map with the little orange squares. The player could enter the teleporters and it would zip them over to the next set of caves where they could run through the cave, out onto the ledge, and back in, you know, through the chain, and it would lead them to the enemy base. The next path was low, down on the floor of the level, the canyon floor, and it was suitable for vehicles, big wide open spaces with huge patches of ice. If you drove over the ice on a wheelbase vehicle, it could cause you to spin out of control and lose traction. The third path ran through a series of rooms at the center of the map, kind of a winding little maze-like path. Uh, and the time that it took to go in through the maze matched the time that it took to go through the teleporter chain. I spent a great deal of time tweaking the size and layout of Sidewinder so that the timing for each path was roughly the same. And there was a final teleport location on the cliffs that allowed direct access to the enemy base. So if the defending team didn't intercept incoming enemies on that high path, the attackers could simply run into the teleporter and be in your base with zero resistance. That connection was by design. 
Orion and the playtest team had some complaints. During their last playtest, they fell to griping about the fact that the top teleport chain led directly into their base. They felt that it made the base too hard to successfully defend. It's too easy for the enemy to get in. And Ryan showed up at my desk insisting that I change the flow of the map so that the teleport chain ended up outside the base rather than inside. He insisted quite loudly that the level would be more fun if it was easier to defend. Now I have to admit, I had a moment of weakness. And this is how the, end, the level ended up shipping, with the top teleport chain broken. And unfortunately, what that did was break the overall flow of the level in two important ways. First, it meant that the top path took a whole lot longer than either of the other two paths to go from base to base, which immediately made it less useful than either of the other two paths. The second huge problem was with the change after a short time, players discovered an exploit where they could jam their vehicles into the bottom of the base, making it virtually impossible for enemies on the outside to come in through the front doors and making matches get prolonged indefinitely. These were both terrible outcomes in terms of the overall design. I broke the map because I listened to a limited data point, Ryan, who was annoyed, and I went against my own better judgment, and more importantly, against the clear intentions of the design of the map. So here's the lesson that I want you to take away. When you get feedback, don't overreact to it. Take it in and think about it. Never make changes if you're overtired or you're feeling emotional. And always, always compare the proposed changes with the intentions of the design. Now that's not to say that you might your design might be wrong. Your intentions might be off base, but if you're if you're coming from a good point of design and you've got good clarity on the intentions, going in and mucking around in that uh, is usually a bigger conversation whether or not you actually had the right intentions in the first place, rather than just making changes that go contrary to what it was that you were trying to achieve. Okay, moving on. A pirate captain walked in the door of his favorite water and hole with the steering wheel of his ship shoved down the front of his pants. The bartender looked up from behind the counter and called out, Hey, Captain, you've got a ship wheel shoved down your pants. The captain nodded forlornly and replied, Arr, I know, it's driving me nuts. Hardy, hardy, har, har. When it comes to getting feedback as you're developing your levels, I found that it's invaluable to have three particular types of playtesters to rely on. They are the pro, the genre fan, and the novice. I recommend that every level designer find and cultivate these kinds of relationships for the projects that they're working on. These are your trusted voices, and their feedback can help you refine your own thinking about the work you're doing and help you correct major errors before releasing your work to a larger audience. Your pros are hardcore users. These are the people who know every trick, and who read up on every strategy and enjoy finding exploits to maximize their own success. Even if your own game isn't finished enough so that players can be considered quote-unquote pros at playing it, you can usually find people who are hardcore players in products like yours that are in your genre space and get comparative feedback from them. So in other words, if you are making a competitive shooter uh, find people who are hardcore players of other competitive shooters that are in the same genre space. Pro players can often show you strategies that are possible in your designs that you'd never imagined, and they can help you find flaws that you never anticipated. The genre fan may not spend the time or energy necessary to become pro, but they still enjoy the genre that they're playing in, 
and they like to buy all of the highest profile titles in it. When you're watching the genre fan play, or listening to their feedback, it's handy to imagine that they are the voice of most players. Think of the genre fan as your average consumer. If a puzzle is too hard to figure out, or a battle is too hard to beat after a reasonable number of attempts, then you might have a real issue to address with your design. Finally, find your novice player. This is a kind-hearted individual or individuals that don't play games, or perhaps just not this particular genre of game, but they're willing to be a guinea pig for your content. <laughs> I always found it incredibly valuable to watch novice players to see if my designs would hold up for people with little skill or experience. Let me warn you, watching a novice play your work can be incredibly humbling. Let's talk about a few other sources that you'll probably get feedback from. Remember that the consumer approaches playing games like a moviegoer approaches watching a movie, with a willingness to overlook flaws and give the product the benefit of the doubt. I like to call this their desire to enjoy, similar to the willing suspension of disbelief present in a movie audience. But player feedback isn't always sweet or supportive, and some of the other voices that you might get feedback from can be even more... bitter. Testers are a different case entirely. Testers have often played your game so much that they are de facto pro players, but they don't have the same quote-unquote desire to enjoy that a retail customer has. It's a tester's job to find holes, problems, bugs, exploits. And when they do, they spend a considerable amount of time recording those problems and reporting them back to the development team. And sometimes these bugs or suggestions can take a very long time to be addressed, if they ever are. This can lead some testers to develop a fairly jaded attitude, which can filter through into their feedback. Of course, that's not always the case, and their ire usually isn't personal. Testers tend to be passionate gamers who just want the game to be the best it can be. But playing the same game over and over and continually seeing the same flaws could drive anybody a little nuts. The tester mindset can skew feedback that the team gets, but it's not really fair to ask the testers to go easy on the design. After all, their job demands the exact opposite. Instead, it's critical that designers take responsibility for filtering the feedback from testers and account for it in the changes ourselves. Feedback from powerful voices outside the development environment are a reality. Feedback like this may come from vice presidents, CEOs, producers, venture capitalists, marketing experts, you name it. Negative feedback from a source like this can be especially disruptive to a game project because those opinions often carry so much extra clout. Of course, you have to be open and responsive to the feedback. Often, sources like these control the fate of entire projects in their hands, and you ignore them at your peril. But try to learn as much as you can about where the comments that they're making are coming from before you panic and go off and start making wholesale changes. I've found that the most constructive way to address this kind of feedback is to identify the intention behind the comments. As always, the key is not to overreact to any source of feedback. If you hear that an encounter is not fun or it's too hard, make sure you understand the skill level of the person offering the feedback. Do they play games in this genre? Do they have some expectations about the experience that aren't being addressed? Are there systems or features that you've already planned for that are currently missing but might address the concerns that they're raising? Don't be patronizing. Be responsive, but don't overreact. Let me take a second to warn you about another very real problem. That of creator boredom. 
it is easy for a game maker to become such a master of their own game, they no longer feel any kind of challenge while they're playing it. That's normal, since we're building and reviewing our content all the time. But creator boredom arises when the person making the content decides that whatever they're working on is just too easy. In fact, it's probably boring, and players are going to hate it. The solution, when a person reaches that point, is inevitably to make whatever they're building hard enough so that they feel like it's an interesting challenge to them. Remember, developers are pro plus players of our own game. Content that we find interesting usually ends up being way too hard for most players. It's a good rule of thumb that your levels should be calibrated so that the earlier levels in the game can be finished by anyone, but later content requires some real skill and mastery over the mechanics. But of course a lot will depend on your specific content strategy, uh, whatever you're following for your project, and that of course is something that we will define fully in later modules. Finally, let me add this little bit of wisdom. Players only judge the game based on the content that ships. Nobody will ever know what ended up on the cutting room floor. Look at your level as it comes together and decide what's at the heart of the experience. What could you cut to make it less complex, less unwieldy, and more refined? And here is a scary but truly powerful concept that I want you to embrace. You should be prepared to cut content every time you do a formal review of your work. Okay, let's review the concepts for iteration. By now it should come as no surprise that step one in the iterative process is to clarify your intentions. Review your work regularly using a healthy combination of subjective and database feedback. Find voices that you know you can trust and rely on to give you feedback on your work. Trust your own instincts and trust your plan. Don't overreact to any feedback, regardless of the source. Avoid author boredom and always be prepared to subtract from your design. I wanted to sneak in here at the end and add one last thought about iteration. Deadlines are a common challenge in every creative industry. But remember that part of the process is letting go and sending your work out into the world. I love this quote from the legendary Broadway composer Leonard Bernstein, who says, To achieve great things, two things are needed. A plan and not quite enough time. Don't iterate forever. Make it, ship it, and then move on to the next project. Okay, see you in Unit 2.